Good, so good to see you on this uh, spring Wednesday evening. And it's been kind of a cloudy, rainy day, but still God has blessed us with this time together. We also welcome uh, the few of you joining us on Facebook Live. We're thankful that you're with us tonight. And uh, just pray that God blesses our time tonight. Thank you for taking the time here in midweek uh, to worship and, uh, and to look into his word. As In just a few moments, we'll continue on in our study of the eight visions of Zechariah. I think we're on number five tonight, so we're about halfway through. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are eternally grateful for your grace and your mercy, your many blessings. Forgive us, O oh Lord, uh, for overlooking even the most simplest of blessings sometimes in our day. Help us to be mindful of just how wonderful and good and holy and righteous you are. We come tonight, Lord, to look into your word, but also to um, ask your presence to be among us, to speak to us through the Holy Spirit, and God, to uh, make our time together fruitful tonight. And Lord, just use this time to build us up in our faith. Help us to trust you even more, even more. Help us to grow in our faith, no matter how long we've been Christians, uh, Lord. And there are many, so many in our families, our friends, our church, uh, and around us, Lord, and circumstances and situations happening in our nation, around the world, they need, they need your prayers. And Lord, we lift them up to you tonight, asking, oh God, for your mercy to be upon them. We have some even in our church that are not able to be with us tonight, that are sick and dealing with illness and surgery and loss of loved ones. Comfort them, O oh God, and bring healing to their body. And God, uh, as we open your word here in just a few moments, we pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will illuminate your words. And Lord, that we might hide your word in our hearts, that we might not sin against you. Forgive us of our sin, O oh God. Help us to truly repent. Receive our worship tonight and our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Brandon, if you will, come and lead us. Good evening. If you would uh, stand, we'll start with our hymn tonight. It's going to be 386. Brethren, we have met to worship. 386. Oh. 
Oh, sorry. Let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners till our God makes all things new. Sweet manna all around. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I'm thankful for tonight and our time together, and I'm already looking forward uh, to Sunday as well. And I pray that you are also. Uh, this Sunday morning, if you haven't joined in a Sunday school class, it'll be a great time to jump in as we start a new series this Sunday morning. And this series I'm also going to follow along in the sermons with, and it's called Being an Authentic Church. Being an Authentic Church. So this is a great time at 10 o'clock uh, to come be with us in Sunday school. And then, of course, morning worship at 11 o'clock. And uh, we're looking forward to a great time together. So we pray that you can be with us. If you absolutely physically uh, are unable to do that, we do provide a Sunday school lesson for you uh, online, on Facebook, and also on YouTube. And I believe it also goes on our website as well. And then, of course, Lord willing, uh, we'll be live at 11 o'clock uh, Sunday morning. Well, turn with me, if you will, to the book of Zechariah, and tonight we go into chapter 4, and we're looking specifically at these eight visions of Zechariah, but we're also uh, applying it to our lives today, and how they can still speak to us in the days in which we live. This uh, fifth vision uh, is important to the worship of the people. Worship is so important in the life of God's people. It always has been, and it always will be, even throughout eternity. Uh, worship will be even more precious uh, when we have uh, been decontaminated and made new and to forever dwell in the glories of the new heaven and the new earth and the kingdom of God. However, worship is important, but it must be real worship. And not something just manipulated by man. And yet worship takes place in and through the life of mankind. We are the ones who worship. Worship does at least three things, or it should do at least three things. It doesn't always, but it should do at least three things. One, first and foremost, worship must glorify God. First and foremost, that's what worship must do. Secondly, as we do glorify God and lift our praises up, it blesses the worshipers. It blesses us as we worship the Lord. But another thing that genuine worship does, it shines a light for a watching world to see God's glory and not man's glory. If the spotlight is on man, something's wrong with the worship. But if it shines a spotlight upon the Lord, and that's what the Holy Spirit does, by the way. He shines the light upon Jesus Christ. He draws people to the Lord Jesus and the gospel. But those are three things that genuine worship does. First, it glorifies God. Secondly, it blesses worshipers as we glorify God. Thirdly, it shines a light for the world around us to see God's glory uh, and prayerfully come to him as Lord and Savior. I'll say this, it's sad and disheartening that worship has become a battleground for many and a playground for others. That grieves me just as much of things I see online of how some people treat worship. To some it's a battleground, to others it's a playground. Worship should be holy ground as we come together to glorify God and lift high the name of Jesus Christ. 
we should take seriously our assembling together and we should take serious of what happens in a worship service. And I will say that especially uh, on that Sunday morning Lord's Day at 11 o'clock. Uh, I'm not saying it shouldn't be enjoined. It, it should be uh, enjoined to the child of God. But uh, it's not a time just to have fun and please everybody that's there. There's plenty of time to do those things. We do those. We should do that at other times. Worship should be taken seriously. If not, we're on the playground. Uh, it shouldn't be a time of war or else we're on the battleground. But it should be a place of holy ground. So our first question should not be when it comes to worship, is it fun? Uh, that annoys me when someone, that's their main agenda with worship. Secondly, uh, does it please and shine the light on certain people? That's another question that is asked sometimes in sermon and uh, services. Are we pleasing brother so-and-so? Are we pleasing sister such-and-such? -such? You've missed worship if that's what you're worried about. Our first question should not be, is it fun or does it please and shine the light on certain people? But our first responsibility should be this, does it honor God? Does it honor God? Does it lift high the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ? Is God's way, here's another important aspect of worship. Is God's way of salvation or the gospel made clear so that we might respond to him rightly and rejoice in the way of redemption. Is God honored? Is the name of Jesus Christ lifted up, our Savior? Is the gospel presented in the things that we say, in the scripture that we read, in the sermons that we preach, in the songs that we sing, in the hymns that we sing? Is the gospel being related among the hearers and celebrated by those who have been saved by it? Now, you might be wondering, what does that have to do with our scripture tonight? It has everything to do with our scripture tonight. In the context of our scripture, scripture, Judah had a lot of rebuilding to do in the land and in the city of Jerusalem. After returning to the land, after years of brokenness and captivity. But before businesses were to be rebuilt, God was serious about his people rebuilding True worship. True worship needed to be reinstated and the temple needed to be rebuilt so that could happen in that old Mosaic law. The people had no doubt become overwhelmed and in many ways were discouraged with the rebuilding. Uh, they had begun and then had, the building had stopped. And so the visions of Zechariah were given to instruct the people of Judah and also to encourage the people in the rebuilding task that was before them. And so, all this has to do with rebuilding genuine worship in Jerusalem. That being said, let's go to Zechariah chapter 4, and we'll begin in verse 1, and we'll read through verse 14. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me, like a man who is awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl on the top of it and seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my Lord. And then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain. And he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. And then of the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. 
And then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. And then I said to him, What are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? And a second time I answered and said to him, What are these two branches of the olive trees, which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out? And he said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my Lord. And then he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Well, the fifth vision of Zechariah has to do with a golden lampstand and two olive trees. The golden lampstand has to do with worship in the temple. In their day, and as it was instructed by God, the temple always had a lampstand providing light within it. The light produced by the lampstand represents God's glory and his ever-abiding presence with his people. Moreover, the lampstands may also symbolize the people and the role that they played reflecting the Lord's light to other nations around them as they worship. Again, the people in their day, and we too still need this, but the people needed to be reminded of their need to worship for the spiritual health and well-being of the nation. That's where it began. That's why God was so serious about them finishing the temple. And here the Lord is reminding them that his light, his presence, is always shining before them and is always shining upon them. Well, still today, true worship reminds the worshiper of God's abiding presence. That's one thing that happens when we worship. Worship lights our souls so that we might remember what the Lord has done for us in the past. That is another thing we should experience during true and genuine worship. We cannot afford to bypass worship in our lives, and many are today. I've heard that a lot in the last 25, 30 years of my life. Well, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. It's true. You could be saved outside of a church building. But that's a terrible excuse to have. You're missing true worship with God's people. And that's where it begins. Anything we try to do or anything we try to be as a Christian without worship first will fail. And that was the message to the people. Rebuild the temple. Restore the worship that was once experienced among God's people in Jerusalem again. We cannot afford to bypass worship in our lives. Be it privately, we should worship privately. But by the way, most people that say you don't have to go to church to be a Christian, they don't worship privately either. But we do are to worship privately, and we are also to worship corporately when we gather on the Lord's Day. Well, the Jewish people in their day, they were looking for strength and stability as they had come back into this broken down land. Where would they find it? Where will we find strength and stability? Well, in the worship of the Lord, as they are reminded of their God, as they're reminded of his care for them and his power to accomplish his promises. Look again with me, if you will, at verse 6. And then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Well, for some of us, this is a well-known verse of the Old Testament. Uh, the oil for the lampstand in the temple symbolizes the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, and it continues the theme of the Lord's provision in rebuilding the temple. In other words, God provides us the Holy Spirit. He's speaking of that in this vision. 
that it wasn't by man's might, it wasn't by their power, but it would be by the Spirit. God would provide His presence that would strengthen them to rebuild, that would bless them as they came again to worship. And so the work in rebuilding the temple was to be completed, but again, not just by human might or power, but by God's divine power. God would even use enemies like Persia to supply the resources for the project, and God would provide the might and the power needed to complete it so that proper worship could be reinstated and experienced once again in Jerusalem. Now, we understand that it was by God's power, by His Spirit, but the people, as we do still today, would still have to put hands and feet to their faith. And they would also need to trust the Lord and overcome the many discouragements that were prevalent among their struggling community. We too struggle at times, amen? I know I sure do. We too still have to overcome discouragement in our lives and in the life of a church. There are things that can be discouraging at times. And overcoming these things as God's children begin with genuine worship. And putting our faith in the power of the Lord and in His divine storehouse of resources. That's where it begins. That's how we'll overcome the discouragements that come against us. You know, truly, mankind can do amazing things. Many people do amazing things. But only what the Lord accomplishes in and through the lives of His people has lasting effects in this life and in the life to come. The Jews rebuilding would be reminded that the might and the power needed to accomplish the rebuilding of the temple would not come from man, but the Spirit of the Lord would supply all of their needs so that God's will would be accomplished. However, we must understand that God will work through human resources. He does do that. He works through people and human resources. We still must have a drive or a proper motivation to see the task completed that is before us in rebuilding what has been destroyed in our life. And again, uh, we've talked about that over the last few weeks. There's lots of things that need rebuilded, rebuilding in our life at times. It might be emotional issues. It might be physical issues, health issues, relationships, jobs, spiritual we still must swallow our fleshly pride at times, and we must be willing to be used by God in order for Him to work in our lives. We too need to understand, I need to be reminded at times, Alan, it's not by your might, it's not by your power that this is going to succeed, but it's by the Spirit of the Lord. They still had to take the provided material and rebuild with faith and joy in God's promises. Many voices were telling them that it could not be done. But it did happen. Why? Because God willed it to happen. And He provided for their needs. And we too must be willing to see areas of our Christian lives rebuilt. And there's always a building project to do in our lives. Amen? Don't ever think that you come to a place where there isn't either. Because that's dangerous ground to be upon. We never come to a point where we say, I've got this all figured out. We must believe and put our hands to work, being supplied with the very Spirit of God to see it through. God was relaying to them through this vision that the rebuilding of the temple would succeed if and only if the Lord stood before, beside, and behind their efforts. Our goal still today should be to join the Lord in His purposes and plans. Now there's a great difference, isn't there? A lot of times we, Lord, bless our efforts. Nothing wrong with that if uh, they're led by the Lord. It's quite another thing to see where the Lord is working and join Him in His work. As opposed to always working to 
dig out our path and then say, Lord, I need you to bless everything I'm doing here. It might not even be his will for our lives. It's another thing for us to join the Lord in his work. The rebuilding of the temple was God's will for his glory and also for the good of the people. That's what they needed. And he was going to bless them and he was going to make the land fruitful again. And we've already looked at that in past weeks, but they had to trust him as we still do today. And they had to follow his plan for rebuilding their lives, their worship, and their community. And again, we must remember that whatever we are accomplishing for and with the Lord begins and ends with, as we've said, true worship. Look with me, if you will, again in verses 7 through 9. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain. and He shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. And then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And so whenever and whatever we are rebuilding in our lives, there are mountains that stand in our way. You can just take that to the bank. There's going to be a mountain standing in the way. The work of rebuilding is rarely met without opposition of some kind. We should never be surprised to see mountains standing in our way trying to intimidate us and in our work for the Lord's will to be accomplished. And understand this, the greater the work for the Lord, guess what? The greater the mountain will be. And that's to remind us what has already been said. That I can't move the mountains, but the Lord can. I don't have the strength to overcome the power of the mountains, but the Lord does. God's people had a large mountain in front of them, and they would have to look at that mountain of imposing opposition through the eyes of faith, specifically faith in who God was and his power. In verse 7, the Lord is encouraging the people that he would level the mountain of opposition and make it level ground for them to build upon. He's encouraging them, I will level this mountain. And You and I also have our mountains. There are things in our path that try to keep us from building and rebuilding. But if we will look at them through the lens of faith in God's power, guess what he'll do? He will also, in his time... And in his way, remove them and give us strength and wisdom to rebuild what has been broken down. And if he doesn't remove the mountain, he'll give us strength to climb it and come out on the other side. Well, in this vision, God asserts the certainty of the completion of the temple. It would be completed. Why? Because of God's watch care and his provision. They had to look beyond the rubble that once was their temple, and they had to envision with faith and see the new temple in their hearts and their minds. We have to do the same thing today. Only when we look with faith beyond the mountain and set our minds uh, to work do we experience God's faithfulness, allowing us to look back after the project and see God's power and give him praise for his divine aid in our lives. Verse 10 says, For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Well, whatever we are attempting to rebuild in our lives with the Lord's help, there will be critics. Amen? Those who reject and despise what we are building, and they'll also criticize our techniques used. There were those, especially among the Jews, uh, that rejected how others were building the temple back. Most of their opposition at this point were coming from within the land. At this point, it wasn't Persia that was opposing them. It was their own people, many of them, and leaders. But the temple would be Rebuilt and glory and worship would be restored to Jerusalem. And so I encourage us with this, or the Lord does, don't allow 
the critics, to dissuade you from your work. Keep building with faith and joy, for the Lord of hosts is with you when you are building for his glory. Amen. Now the lampstand of worship must be built and rebuilt at times that it might shine brightly for the glory of the kingdom of God. And so don't allow a few critics who might have selfish motives, and uh, many of the Jewish leaders in their day, they did have selfish motives or negative attitudes. Don't allow those motives and attitudes to keep you from worshiping and glorifying God in your lives. Verses 11 through 14, And then I said to him, What are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? And a second time I answered and said to him, What are these two branches of the olive trees, which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out? And he said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my Lord. And then he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Well, the second part of this vision had to do with the two olive trees that were to right and the left of the golden lampstand. And Zechariah himself asked about the olive trees and their meaning. He didn't understand it at first. And these olive trees, he saw they were healthy and they were lush and they were full of branches and filled with oil. And these golden pipes, he speaks of the golden pipes. You have the olive trees, the lush and beautiful, filled with oil, and they're pouring the oil into the golden pipes, and it allowed the oil to flow unaided by human hands directly into the burning lampstand to keep the flame of worship burning. That's what God does for us through the Holy Spirit. Here God is showing them his perpetual blessing of mercy and grace upon their spiritual lives. It again showed them that God would provide for them as they faced daunting challenges. Oil was precious to them in their day. And throughout the Old Testament, oil symbolizes honor and joy and God's favor upon the lives of his people. But oil was also used for the healing of physical wounds. We're familiar with Psalm 23 and 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. He's speaking of healing. Oil put on the body to heal it. Psalm 45 and verse 7 says, You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Isaiah 60, 1 and 3 says, To grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. I'm so thankful that God still provides the oil that we need to burn brightly through his presence, the Holy Spirit. As we've stated repeatedly, rebuilding our spiritual lives can be challenging and difficult, and it will be met with opposition, and it will be met with distractions. There will be setbacks. However, God will honor the work that we do for his glory and the good of the kingdom of God, and we must believe that, no matter how few are ready to build. He will provide the oil of the Holy Spirit to bless our work and keep our inner flame of worship burning, bringing us healing and joy when our enemies seek to bring us harm. God has established his priest and king by anointing them with his heavenly oil, the Holy Spirit. And there in verse 14, I think verse 14 is fulfilled through the life of the anointed Messiah, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the anointed great high priest and the reigning king of God's kingdom that stands before the whole earth and that one day will be worshipped by all. Jesus is, if you will, the anointing oil that keeps our flame burning brightly for God's glory and for the well-being of his people. So in closing tonight, we, we can trust God the Father, we can trust God the Son, We can trust God, the Holy Spirit, 
to supply all of our needs as we labor for God's glory here on earth. So keep building upon the firm foundation that has been laid for us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you will see God's hand upon your life and you'll be blessed to experience his glory throughout all eternity. What a wonderful time of worship that will be. How firm a foundation, O saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, who unto the Savior for refuge has fled? Fear not, I am with you. O be not dismayed, for I am your God and will still give you aid. I'll strengthen you, help you, and cause you to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. As we close tonight, keep the lamp of worship burning. Protect worship. God will provide the oil, and he will bless us abundantly. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for providing for our needs. Help us, O oh God, to be in your will in our lives and in the lives of this local church. Provide for our needs as only you can and remind us tonight and in the days and weeks and years to come that it's not by our might or by our power but by your spirit that your work is completed. In the same sense, Lord, quicken our spirits and ready our hands and feet to be willing and help prepare our minds, O Lord, uh, to serve you and to be ready for the task that is before us building of the kingdom of God. Encourage the hearts of those that are struggling to rebuild even tonight. Help all of us, Lord, to look past the ashes and the rubble of destruction and to see prosperity again. And help us to keep our eyes focused and set upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, for those of you on Facebook Live, thank you for joining us for our Bible study tonight. Again, if you can be with us this Sunday in house, it would be a great time to be here uh, for Sunday school at 10 and morning worship at 11 as we'll be looking at uh, being an authentic church. Be praying. And God bless you. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.